Hi, and welcome to this new webinar on cloud protection trends for 2023. My name is Jason Buffington. I'm Vice President Market Strategy and the Office CTO at Veeam. Joining me today, Leah, I am so glad to have you for this. Thank you so much for having me. So everything we're going to cover today is from the Cloud Protection Trends research. Now, this research um, just published in uh, the beginning of November of 2022 as a way to help organizations get ready for um, their cloud um, production and protection strategies for the 2023 year. Um, we encourage folks to follow along. We're going to share some data, but not all of it. Um, you can go to vee.am slash CPT, Cloud Protection Trends 23, um, or just hit that QR code, dang it, in the in that uh, left-hand corner. So. This particular survey, Veeam uses uh, third-party unbiased analyst firms. They go and do blind surveys uh, to, to find out what IT leaders are looking for in various solution scenarios. This particular one, the research was done in the fall of 2022, looking at both production and protection. So IaaS and SaaS and PaaS and BaaS and DRAS and any other ASs we can squeeze in there as well. Um, but we've kind of moved that data around a little bit to kind of have a couple topics for discussion for today. Uh, you know, Leah, you come from the from the solution side of Veeam. I come from the from the CTO's office. Um, I think what's going to be fun is to kind of look at all the different permutations of the why and the who and the how and the what um, that involves for this. But uh, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get started um, with with setting the stage on the why, right? So, what are the challenges? that are driving um, uh, the strategies that we see folks adopting in 2022, moving into 2023 and beyond. This is actually one of my favorite charts. Uh, in fact, if you've uh, followed the weekly live stream that Veeam does, um, uh, this is a, a research piece that we've done over time. This is from the Data Protection Trends Report, not CPT. Um, and in that research, it's kind of our macro study um, in the 2022 report, it had 3,400 organizations from 28 different countries around the world. And, um, and one of the questions that we've asked every year in DPR 20, 21, and 22 uh, was what percentage of your, of your production servers are physical? You see those responses on the left. What percentage are virtual machines within the data center? See those responses in the middle of the screen. And what percentage are cloud-hosted workloads? You see that on the right-hand side, meaning either from a hyperscale cloud, Amazon, Azure, Google, um, or a managed service provider providing um, infrastructure as service. And, and over time, we got the results from 20, from 21, from 22. In 21, we asked, what do you think it's going to be two years later? That gives us 23. In 22, we asked what's going to be two years later. That gives us 24. We've interleaved all that data in. And I, and I think there's two macro things that kind of come out of this. The first one is um, when you look at that, that radical shift between 2020 and 2021, um, that survey work was done pre-COVID and post-COVID um, in the 20 and 21 data results. And so certainly you see that um, like everything else that happened um, in the first year of that pandemic, um, anything that was data center centric was put on hold, whereas anything that you could do in a cloud typically was accelerated. So you do see a, a pretty significant jump that happened during that first year. <laughs> but then after that, everything kind of normalizes, right? So you see there's, a, there's a, a nice gradual decline on the physical servers that we see on that left-hand side. And, and you can attribute that to almost more of a dilution that as organizations embrace cloud first, yeah, the amount of physical you still have, not a whole lot of folks spinning up a bunch of new physical, that's going to have a gradual decline. Technically, in the virtualization space, we're pretty even, right? 23, 25, 24, 24. And then there's this big hockey stick over here. Now, we're presenting this as December 2022. Interestingly enough, when you look at, so we're right on this cusp right here of 2022 versus 2023. And Leah, I got to say, I love this gap because this is where we go from the minority, 49% of servers that have been cloud hosted, to a majority, 52%. It's an exciting time. Um, to be in this space. You've been watching this space for a while as well, not only from Veeam, but in, in other past lives as well. 
What did you see when you looked at at uh, how the shape of this three data sets came? You know, what's interesting is over the last 10 years, let's say, you go to a conference or you listen to an analyst and the message has been clear for a long time that cloud is the future, cloud has all these amazing benefits. But what's been interesting over the last couple of years is this tremendous pinch and drive to actually transform workloads into the cloud, whether that's net new or lift and shift. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, but this is really that, that key year, right? Where I think now it's not a let's convince folks about the cloud. It's really how to do cloud well and how to get real about the cloud. Because as there's been this pinch over the last few years, whether that's due to trying to keep virtualization investment flat, whether that's having a difficult time even getting bare metal, it means that so many workloads and organizations are having to figure out how to get those workloads to the cloud. And there's some challenges with that. I think there's some tremendous um, leadership that's needed in the industry to try to figure out how do we block and tackle to support the needs of these organizations because this is really the time to start taking cloud seriously and figuring out how do we transform not only what is being hosted there, but how to do it well from yep. a protection standpoint, from a security standpoint, there's a lot of angles to look at it at. Fair points, absolutely. All right, so let's kind of, let's click that double click in. Let's take a look at how that journey is actually progressing along the way. To do that, now we're gonna focus really using that cloud protection trends research. There's two questions that kind of come to mind. Um, uh, I'm calling this there and back again. So the journey of workloads going to clouds or how workloads start up in a cloud is probably a, a more accurate way to say that. One of the questions in the new research actually asked, um, thinking about production words brought online within the last year, what percentage came from each of the following? Now, I'm a I'm a half half full versus half empty uh, kind of guy, but I think the thing which is interesting to note here is that only two thirds of the workloads that spun up in the cloud in 2021 actually <coughs> um, uh, were migrated away. Um, from uh, from the data center. One third of them were simply organizations embracing a cloud first strategy. And so if something could come up in a cloud, they, uh, um, they, they did it that way. And I like that result because certainly we know it's not like um, uh, a third of the workloads within the data center are being decommissioned at nearly the same rate. So you are seeing a, a blossoming of cloud workloads um, disproportionately higher in rate than those that are doing on uh, that are decommissioning from the data center. Therefore, what you're seeing is the data center is simply being diluted, not necessarily replaced. And I think that's important because for many years to come, I think the data center and, and on-prem infrastructure still absolutely um, has uh, 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 has relevance in modern IT. That Certainly, said, and, and what's interesting about that is I think that having research like this for those of you in the audience is really critical because it's so easy for us to get pigeonholed into what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis of thinking about, oh gosh, I have this mandate from my CIO to have a cloud-first approach or oh gosh, you know, I can't get a server now and I, I need to find a way to move this workload that's lived on-prem forever into the cloud and the cloud is different. It's easy for us to get bogged down in that kind of what's right in front of your face viewpoint. So hopefully for those of you in the audience, you're able to take a look at a stat like this and maybe it's affirming your experience. And if it's not, if your organization has only been doing a cloud-first net new approach, maybe that means you're a little bit behind, right? So research like this is so helpful. Again, I really encourage everybody to download the research report on their own. And please let us know in the Q&A, what, what challenges have you been having with that? Is this your experience or do you have a completely different experience? We'd love to hear from you. Um, but certainly, Jason, I know, obviously I know what's coming in terms of why we said there and back again. Um, I think some of those challenges are really important for us to be really clear on and, and recognize the complex reality that is cloud. Yeah, so let's go through that as well. So the the first question the first half was how did you get there? The second or or spin up. The second question is have you ever brought anything back again? 
right? And so um, uh, notice here in the gray wedge, about 12% of organizations said no. Um, that does mean 88% said yes. And of those that said yes, they could check more than one box. Um, I, I like the fact there's a pretty even balance here. Um, about 40% mm -hmm. of folks, they had a disaster, right? So um, it's like uh, you have a flat tire on the side of the road, you pull the spare out of your trunk, but you were never planning on living off the spare. Um, so as soon as you get back on the road and get it fixed, the original tire goes back on. So bringing stuff back again um, after a disaster, very common scenario, 40% of respondents. Um, I think there's uh, on that far right hand side, there's a lot of environments where the developers don't have access to the same kind of development infrastructure they used to have in years past, because that's a fantastic scenario to use cloud infrastructure. And so for many organizations, about half actually, 49%, they deved in the cloud, but then um, they'd always planned on running it on-prem along the way. And then, then there's that really interesting lime green, 43%, middle of the right-hand side of the screen, um, where we really talk about the traditional repatriation issue, where the idea is, is that, yeah, okay, maybe it was more expensive than they thought, it was more compute-heavy than they thought, whatever the case is, um, uh, that there was a, a repatriation goal that kind of comes out of that. So, uh, so certainly that's one area that uh, that's interesting to kind of come through. Absolutely, and you know, a, a couple of months ago, I was at a community event called our Veeam 100 event, um, and we presented content to a group of what we call the Veeam vanguards. These are influencers in the community who have been longtime Veeam users and you know, speak the word of Veeam at a VMworld event or on their blogs. So they're really the kind of audience that can get critical and have a great conversation with us. I showed this stat to them and I heard so many stories of why a workload maybe started out in the cloud with the best of intentions and had to be brought on premises. One that I'll just briefly tell here, um, somebody was from a, a large organization that has a significant brick and mortar footprint. And in order to support that brick and mortar, they have access cards. That's how everybody gets into certain buildings and certain rooms. And they had planned on moving the server that authenticates those um, mechanisms from on-prem to the cloud. And they did all this work and they, they tested it on a small scale, but then they go live on one particular day and their issue tickets flooded. Because while yes, it did work, there was an increased latency time of access from something like two to five seconds to more like 15 seconds. And so folks thought that their key cards weren't working, they submitted issue tickets, and all of a sudden you have a latency issue. That meant that they had to rapidly move that workload back to an on-premises, but they'd completely re-architected it. So now they have a sort of Frankenstein on the back end, and again, that was a challenge that maybe they could have anticipated, but I bet most wouldn't have. Um, so this just means that for those of us who are on the data protection side, understanding that yes, cloud is the focus and I'm on the cloud team, I'm happy to preach the word of cloud, but I think it's helpful to really get realistic about what it means to transform like this and, and how data protection, backup, recovery, all plays a role in that. Um, you know, Veeam certainly has portable solutions it's very important to Veeam's DNA that we are a mobile solution, that we can back up VMs, servers, a cloud-hosted database, um, and they can go there and back again, all with the support of Veeam. Um, so I just, this is one of my favorite slides. I think that's why I wanted to spend so much time talking about this particular set of research, because I think that for those of you in the audience, and again, please use the Q&A to, to keep up with us and, and let us know what questions you have, or if this is an experience you've had, um, I think this is a really great level setting slide. Awesome, awesome. All right, I'm gonna fly through a couple to set the rest of the table for us um, on a couple things that are driving the rest of the strategy. So now we've seen that um, that hybrid is here to stay. We've seen that that inflection point along the way. We've talked here about, uh, the, about where the servers are coming from. And oh, by the way, the journey to the cloud is not a one-way <laughs> trip, right? 
Um, so let me fly through a few other things that are kind of shaping uh, the, the strategy that we're going to solve for today. The first one is certainly you can't have a conversation about 2023 IT without talking about the R word. Uh, and um, one of the survey questions that was asked in our ransomware survey was when looking at what kinds of data were affected uh, by the uh, by ransomware events. I'd encourage folks to uh, download that research as well. We'll provide links for all of that before uh, the session is over. Uh, but uh, there's a there's a misnomer that's worth talking about in that many organizations might assume, oh, you know, remote offices they're they're more vulnerable because they're on the edge, right? Um, or someone might say, oh, you know, a cloud cloud data is more vulnerable because it's outside of brick and mortar. Uh, and then there are other folks who say, oh, no, 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 it's, it's the data center because that's where most of the people are and silly humans do silly things and that's where phishing starts, right? Turns out it doesn't apply. Um, give or take three points of variation across the way. Um, you know, no matter where it starts, it pervades to the rest of the environment. So when we think about hybrid architecture, we just need to be mindful of the fact that, golly, gee, this stuff is connected um, along the way. Um, there's a couple of points that we should kind of set the table with. Um, this next one is looking at what are the change drivers in 2022? Now, as Veeam, one of the things that we're obviously most interested in is, you know, why would you change your primary backup solution? Um, hopefully to us, not from us, but what is driving change? Right. And so that's what the question is asked. Um, a lot of these research questions, by the way, uh, you'll notice the long lines. <coughs> are choose all that apply. Um, the short lines is only choose one, what's the most important along the way. And I think it's interesting that when the 2022 research came out, the, uh, the uh, most common overall, the long lines, as well as the top two most important, the short lines, both said the same thing. They need backup to work better. And I'm gonna put some color on this as it relates to um, uh, cloud hosted infrastructure because, and, and in this case, I'm leaning predominantly into IaaS um, more than say PaaS and SaaS. So I've been in the data protection space for about 30 years. You know, when virtualization came out about 15 years ago, um, the, the knee jerk reaction was, well, you've got servers running inside of each of those VMs. We'll just put an agent inside of every server the same way that we do physical servers. It'll work just fine. It did not work just fine. Right. And so that so what you figured out was, no, you can't use that old approach to do that. And in fact, if you try to use the old approach to putting agents inside of VMs, what you find is it doesn't work well. Your SLAs go down, your reliability goes down and you wonder why you're not getting good recoveries because you didn't get good backups because you're using an older approach. And I think, unfortunately, that's what many organizations are doing today. And this is what the data kind of bears out is, is that if you're using older methodologies to try to protect new workloads like IaaS and SaaS and PaaS, you invariably are going to have limited results. Uh, and so if you were looking at what's the one thing that's going to drive data protection change for next year is to improve the results because you probably need to improve the methods that you're using along the way. Lee, I know we're a little short on time, but any thoughts on this? Otherwise, I want to take us through one more view of the same problem. I'll just leave a very simple note here, which is that I think reliability continues to percolate as one of the top um, identifiers of a successful solution. So therefore, the opposite of that, why would somebody change reliability? I, I think the emotion behind confidence of success is becoming more and more important simply because tolerance and the threats to availability are, are much higher than they have been in that. the past. I'll take that, yeah. Um, all right, one last similar question on this, and this was, again, from the same research. And the question was around, um, uh, what does enterprise backup mean to you? And again, long lines mean choose all that apply, short lines mean um, if you were buying a new solution today, um, <coughs> Uh, what would be the most important aspect to consider? I think it's very interesting here. The top two responses, um, again, most common as well as most important, kind of tells two sides of the proverbial coin, right? So um, in the number two slot, you have the traditional uh, definition of enterprise, which are those enterprise-centric applications um, like Oracle, SAP, HANA, et cetera. If you look down in the faded list, you'd see that uh, you know traditional platforms in the data center like Unix and NAS come into fray as well. But number one slot, 
right, uh, is the support of cloud-hosted workloads like IaaS and SaaS. And, and in fact, when you look at the short lines on the screen, you'll notice there's a pretty significant step between number one at 21% and number two at, at 13. And after 13, it's a little bit of a rounding error, 1% or, or two all the way down that line. And I'm going to go on a limb here and basically say, look, whatever legacy cruddy backup solution you're probably running in the data center works really great on those legacy workloads running in the data center, right? But the, but what we've traditionally seen is, is that legacy backup solutions, as organizations move or um, amend or append or supplant or however you want to say we're adding cloud workloads, right? As they embrace that cloud first strategy, those legacy approaches for backup are not keeping up. And so, it would make sense to me that, yeah, we've got the rest of the stuff covered. We really just need to get IaaS and SaaS better protected because we're embracing it in production. And we all know when you modernize production, you got to modernize protection. I think that's where that gap is coming from more often than not. And frankly, that tickles me pink because um, if you think back 15 years, um, uh, there was a similar conversation going around where organizations said, hey, we'll use the legacy backup solution we're using for all the physical boxes. But for this virtualization thing, let's go ahead and get something new that's really built for virtualization. And uh, and that's how Veeam really came into the picture. Over time, we said, you know, we can protect the rest of the environment too. And then Veeam took over the rest of the environment. And that's what puts us in the market leadership role that we have today. Um, I think it's going to be delightful to see the organizations that are perhaps first using Veeam um, to protect their Amazon and their Azure and their Google Cloud and their M365 and their Salesforce, et cetera, and then realizing, hey, you know, we can't protect the rest of the environment while they're there. So I think you're going to see that same kind of um, uh, platform dichotomy um, and then the reconvergence back to mainstream over the next couple of years. Thoughts, Leah? Yeah, I think one of the other things to think about, you know, again, this is like a what wakes you up in the morning, what would be exciting in a backup solution. Going back to the flip side of that, what's your big bad wolf? Point products, right? I think that the tolerance for using multiple point products is going down. And that's because we recognize that there's many reasons for an outage. There's many reasons for a cyber attack of how it can get in. And so you just simply can't have a bunch of onesie twosie solutions that aren't enabling you to have an effective organizational policy-based approach to your backup. So we were really excited to see this data. Um, I'm glad to hear that again, you know, for those of you in the audience, it's really great to hear that so many people agree that having cloud included means that we're no longer talking about why do you need to back up the cloud? It's now really looking at it as regardless where your workload resides, do you have the confidence that you can reliably recover in the event of any issue you have? Right, right. All right. Um, I'm doing a time check and I can't find a clock to see how well we're doing, but I'm going to go keep progressing. But if you'll uh, uh, check on that for us along the way, I want to make sure that um, we end on time. The um, Let's go into the next section. So we've laid the groundwork for what are the challenges and what are the goals. So the next thing we want to kind of look at is um, who are the actors that are really involved in this? Because um, if there are lessons that we took away from 15 years ago when we were first coming in and solving the problems around virtualization protection, um, one of the key attributes we understood was is that in many cases, it was not the generic IT operations person that was at least starting the expectations along the way. In many cases, it was the virtualization admin. It was the workload owner who said, look, virtualization looks different than whatever you've seen before. I need to be a bigger part of the equation as to how's, who, how we're defining the strategy and affecting the actual backups and restoration of that new platform. And we're seeing that same kind of trend hold true. Um, let's take a look at SaaS first, and certainly the poster child for SaaS has to be Microsoft 365. Um, one of the things we wanted to look at here was, first, who's defining the requirements? Who's defining the strategy for what needs to be protected, how long it needs to be protected, um, who has access to it, all of those things that are pretty foundational from an IT perspective. And we want to find out do, in this cloudy world, is that still true? And the data bears it out that it is. So you look on the left-hand side, it's the same question, by the way, we're going to talk about the right in a second, but on the left-hand side, 
overall across the organization, um, it's a pretty fair mix. About um, a little over half of organizations include both the 365 administrators and the central IT team. Let's call them sitting at the head of the table. It's a good thing most rectangular tables have two heads. Um, and then you see a pretty healthy blending of uh, data protection specialists and cloud administrators and governance and compliance, folks that you would typically see around almost any kind of workload along the way. Now, just to make sure, is everyone aligned, right? One of the core design questions with this particular research was asking different personas and then finding out, do they agree? The one thing I thought was interesting about, so um, so of the multi-personas that responded to the question, we took the two that were perhaps most diametrically opposed um, from their viewpoints, which is the workload owner for M365, so the SaaS admin, and then the, um, the traditional backup um, uh, administrator or specialist as well. And for the most part, almost everybody agrees. You can see there's very little points of deviation across, uh, com uh, do they both think compliance is there? Yeah, but in a minority role. They both think the cloud folks are there in about two out of five organizations. The backup folks are there in about half of organizations. The 365 folks there are, in, are pretty consistent. Really the only real gap that's notable here is, is that the backup team thinks central IT is involved more than necessarily the, the M365 folks do. That can have some exposure as far as um, who's responsible for retention requirements um, overall. But overall, this is a pretty healthy balance. It says that both sides understand that, um, that you need lots of different folks at the table in order to make this good. Now, this is who's defining strategy and requirements. Let's take a look at who's actually clicking the mouse, though, because I think this actually tells a more interesting story. Now, in, in this case, the question is who's actually managing the backups, the data protection of the data within an M365 environment? Um, and I, I point out a couple things to you. <coughs> uh, first thing, when this question was asked, it actually got asked in two different ways, whether or not um, the organization was using backup as a service, so using one cloud to protect another. I'm a fan of that, by the way. I love the idea of one cloud protecting another. But... Um, what we saw in the data is about a two to one mix between between the, this, the backup team that's responsible for backing up the rest of the environment and the M365 folks that are responsible for their particular work, a little less than a two to one ratio. By the way, that little less than two to one ratio is consistent whether or not the organization was using BAS or not. When BAS is involved, backup is a service, then the BAS um, uh, uh, personnel are responsible for about one in four uh, organizations of actually managing the backups themselves. Um, the rest of the time they're doing mostly capacity planning and then the, the primary teams are responsible. Either way, it's about a two to one mix, a little less than along the way. That's gonna be important when we look at Converse around IaaS. The things that I think I would draw your eye to, which I think are rather interesting, um, on the on the far right hand side, the gap that you see in, in both cases, 365 folks are, are pretty flat on the expectations. But over here, the BAS team, excuse me, the backup team thinks that the BAS folks are involved more than the application owner. And I love that because what that basically says is that you've outsourced the management of backup to a BAS or DRAS provider, and you can't tell because it's a seamless experience, because partnering is working how partnering should be working, right? And so the fact that you don't know that it's actually being outsourced on the management, I like that approach. So this is a healthy, healthy gap here. What may be a challenge for some organizations is um, the 365 folks think that the backup team is doing the backup. It's about half, 54% of the time. Whereas the backup team actually thinks they're only backing up the environment about 40% of the time. This is a recipe for under protection where the SaaS folks think the backup team's doing it. The backup team thinks the SaaS folks are doing it. And you know what? No one's doing it. And so that's where you do get some risk when it's the workload owners versus not. Our, uh, our friend over at Veeam, Corinne Bissett, will often tell you when the backup team's in charge of the backup, that actually means backups are getting done. Um, that's not always true when we look at the various cloud folks that are out there. Now, this is an area that you've lived and breathed. In fact, you, uh, like me, are a Microsoft alum. What are your thoughts on this? And then let's talk about some of the methods that these folks are choosing. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of my main takeaways here is that the 
primary audience for this webinar, at least I'm sure you guys are, are on the data center backup side, right? Um, so I think that we have a real responsibility as backup experts to try to educate some of these new people that we're bringing to the table from SAS, from IaaS, from PaaS, to help them understand the real reality gaps that exist in backup and recovery and what we should be expecting from these solutions. So if I were you guys in the audience, I would really be looking at this as some harsh realities and thinking, what can I do in 2023 to help shore up some of these gaps and make sure that we're meeting compliance requirements, retention goals, all the things that come with these kinds of solutions. Makes sense. Okay. So let's, uh, let's dig into, so now that we know who's kind of driving the boat, let's take a look at what they're going with. So um, we're gonna look at the 365 side and and um, uh, move from there on. One of the things I think is interesting here is when organizations were asked what kind of uh, uh, methods they're using, in this case, third-party product or backup as a service, uh, nearly four out of five organizations are now doing that. It wasn't that many years ago that um, that this number was in the low double digits and most folks were saying oh we just use the recycle bin um, and what you found was that the built-in utility actually is insufficient uh, uh, for a lot of uh, for a lot of scenarios i love the fact that today um, only three percent misunderstand that because a cloud is resilient it's it's uh, still requires previous versions still requires backup i love the fact that only four percent today say the recycle bin is enough Right, um, those folks probably haven't done anything else with it. I'm okay with the four percent that are still looking. You know, collectively that is eleven percent, and then of that, the other eighty-nine percent shows some combination of these, which is worth noting because these do add up to more than a hundred percent. I like the fact that a lot of folks understand that there's some great enhancements that come with E3 and E5, and yet they are not replacements for backup. And so these should add up to more than 100 because there's great value that you get from the premium tiers of 365. It just happens that backup isn't one of them. Let's take a look, though, when we look at um, beyond methods, let's look at the reasons because I think this becomes really interesting for folks as well. And then we're going to look at the IaaS that comes into this um, in addition. Um, <coughs> excuse me. When organizations are asked, why? Why would you back up 365? Doesn't it kind of cover itself along the way? Um, uh, no real surprises here. The same reasons you back up 365 are the same reasons you back up the rest of the environment, right? So cyber is top of mind um, for both the SaaS admins and the backup admins. Compliance and retention is top of mind um, in that number two spot along the way. I gotta admit, a little bit of a guilty pleasure here in the number three slot, the recognition that um, uh, better built in, cap better than the built in capabilities kinds of rounds out the top three. And you can see the rest of the list is the same reasons why you back up the rest of the environment um, along the way. Hey, I could spend a lot more time on 365, but I wanna make sure we get into some of the IaaS and, and PaaS elements that come into this as well. Now, we've covered the questions before for M365, but Leah, walk us through what you're seeing here. When we talked with IaaS and PaaS folks around that same questions on the left of who's defining strategy and on the right, who's clicking the mouse, these seem surprisingly similar. Yeah, they do. I guess surprising and unsurprising, right? <laughs> because ultimately, I think we're seeing that IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, as workloads are transforming into those kinds of services platforms, um, it really the, the owner of that infrastructure or the owner of the workload sort of led the charge, right? That they're, they're kind of front of the line there to try to get that transformation. But now that we've reached that inflection point of more of our workloads living in the cloud than not, now we're really looking at cloud as how can we reach some level of optimization and confidence. And that's where experts from data protection, experts from security and operations and automation, getting, getting your scripting guys involved, that's where you know the time is really now to bring those sorts of skill sets in. Um, what I found really interesting was, in general, who manages the backup? Who is your directly responsible individual I was personally surprised to see the backup team being so high, even for infrastructure, because cloud architects, engineers, admins tend to have a much heavier hand in the infrastructure than a SaaS admin would. 
because I think there's a certain level of like, oh, I only look at what's in front of the camera, not behind the camera in SaaS. But on the cloud side, we really need to know the nuts and bolts. So I was really encouraged to see the backup team be so heavily prevalent here. Again, I think we have a real responsibility to make sure that we're leading with best practices, leading with policy-based approaches. But keep in mind, this question really asks who's responsible, who's the primary responsible person. That doesn't mean that the cloud teams don't have tremendous touch points throughout the process, whether that be um, managing the storage, managing the networking, um, doing recoveries even. So there's a lot of people at the table, Jason. There is, and that's probably a good way to wrap um, for this kind of uh, guidance, because what we're really seeing is, is that <coughs> there's, a, there's a huge blend of uh, all three points of view have to matter, right? So you've got the workload owner who understands the applications that are either running natively within say past delivered file or past delivered database, um, or within those server instances of Windows and Linux instances that are running within IaaS. You've got the backup team that understands the um, what's required from a retention perspective, a granularity, um, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then lastly, um, cloud as a framework and as a platform does have its own nuances. I will confess the first time I was playing with cloud a couple of years ago and, and trying to work out how to make it part of my own hybrid infrastructure, I set up some VMs in a virtual network and I couldn't connect. And so I tweaked some things and I couldn't connect and I tweaked some things and I couldn't connect. And then in retrospect, what I'd finally done, I could connect. And so could everybody else because I turned off every piece of security protocol there was. And so there is a different kind of framework and methodology you have to really understand in order to provide well-secured and yet globally accessible um, infrastructure along the way. So this is gonna define the, the who. Now let's start getting into more on the how. And I think this is where things will start to get really interesting for folks. Because when we look at um, cloud, it's important to think about cloud as both production and protection. And so we've spent some time looking at the landscape of how cloud is being um, pervasive in production. Let's look at it from a protection perspective. And this is, this is admittedly, Leah, one of my favorite slides. We looked at um, uh, what percentage of organizations use the cloud as part of their data protection strategy or not. Those who are using all um, uh, on-premise technologies, those are in the, the blue that you see here, that's the 40% back in 2020, down to 34, down to 33, down to 19. Okay, a little bit of two-point variation there, not a big deal, um, in the on the on-prem. But take a look at the organizations that are embracing cloud as part of their data protection strategy, including both backup as a service, so more of a managed turnkey outcome, as well as simply grabbing that hyperscale uh, storage tier as part of your otherwise traditionally self-managed data protection. And we get from 60 to 66 to 67 to 81 to 79. Basically, the way that I would I would summarize this for folks is over this five-year curve, at the beginning of the curve, three out of five ish organizations um their admins were cloud enabled two out of five were not um and by 2024 four out of five organizations are going to leverage the cloud as part of their data protection strategy and one out of five is going to wonder why they're out of a job anyway that's how i'm going to uh, look at it from an overall trend line but this i think is more of a fun way to kind of look at the journey overall so organizations were asked, this is one of the, one of, I think, the more interesting charts that came out of the, the cloud protection trends for 2023 results. The organization were asked, how did your journey of leveraging cloud and data protection go? Right. And so um, the, the status, so you could ask, you know, you started in cloud uh, as a storage tier and you stayed there. Did you start in cloud and you switched to managed service? Did you start with a managed service? Have you always been a... What are the choices, right? And I think there's two stories that get told. First and foremost, the, the today, draw a line in the sand, about two out of five organizations, 42%, they're leveraging cloud storage. So that's hyperscale object storage from Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, et cetera, um, uh, or a, a dedicated provider, so more like a Wasabi type scenario. Um, and then about three out of five organizations leveraging backup as a service, a managed service solution, where, and I think the main thing that you should think about here is when you're adding cloud storage to your data protection solution, you're still the smartest guy in the room, 
right? Because you're simply managing storage as a layer, as opposed to when you bring in a managed service solution, backup as a service, now you've got other dedicated smart humans beside you that are driving the roles. Now, this is the status quo as it exists today, but this is perhaps maybe the more interesting story to be said, and that is only about 30% of respondents started with one modality, either cloud storage or managed backup services, um, and stayed with what they got. 70% switched from one side to the other. And in fact, it's worth noting, it's a little better than two to one, 48% versus 22%, where they started with simply adding a cloud storage tier and then said, wait, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to outsource the, the expertise as well as the capacity. Um, and so they embrace that managed backup service as opposed to 22%, one out of five, still a good number, that said, okay, I started with managed service, but actually I think I can run my own shop. Uh, but I think this is the more interesting story because it does point people more and more towards um, when you're looking at managed services, understand that a lot of the value you're unlocking is not because of the service. It's not because of the provider of capacity. It's because of what else you get with the monitoring and the expertise that often comes with these kinds of outcomes. Leah, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that when we chat with analysts and certainly anecdotal evidence in the field, so many organizations are feeling the pinch of not having the expertise on staff necessary yep. to not only meet the needs of their organization, but again, from the chart earlier that we love so much, really think about the fact that we now live in a, a storage world that's dominated by cloud. Cloud takes different skill sets from networking to identity and access management to making sure that you don't all of a sudden balloon your bill because that happens more often than not. Um, yep. so, so being able to look to an expert, I think is really a game changer for a lot of organizations. And if they haven't looked before, they certainly will be now. Yeah, and let's take that the rest of the way. So, um, so this is just backup as a service. One of the the um, you know one of the things I'm often quoted on in Twitter is why Baz when you can Draz, right? Instead of just backing up to a cloud and then bringing the data back again when you need it, you know, again, you really want to talk about expertise. That's where disaster recovery and business continuity come in the picture. And again, look at the look at the stats over that five year run. Those folks that are running multi data center, and I'm a big fan of running multi data center, especially when you look at some of the stuff we're doing in V12 and Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator version six. Um, there's some fantastic capabilities that Orchestrator has always unlocked. But you see that dual data center approach is pretty flat. 30% of orgs, 28, 34, 32, 28. Whereas all of the what's really being unlocked and accelerated as it comes to the growth in the BCDR industry and set of capabilities is cloud power, 23, 30, 36, 51, 53, right? Where you're really harnessing, again, not just cloudy infrastructure, which is great, absolutely, sign up for that, but also um, the expertise that often comes from disaster recovery providers and disaster recovery planners. We want to wrap up this section by just kind of pointing out that the cloud and data protection have a lot of different inflection points. Um, in, the, in the DPR research for 2022, organizations were actually asked, you know, what does modern data protection or innovative data protection mean? Those are the long lines, choose all that apply, short lines, what's most important to you. And what we've kind of muted out here is take a look at how many different ways <clears throat> that modern basically should be a synonym for cloudy, right? So all the ways organizations are looking for the attributes of a modern data protection solution, the ability to use cloud infrastructure for DR, the ability to have standardized practices between how you protect on-prem workloads and your IaaS workloads and your SaaS workloads. The ability to move from one cloud to another. So I dev'd in Amazon, but I want to do production in Azure. Um, or I dev'd in Google, but I want to run my production on-prem in a private cloud, right? That fluidity, that mobility, that flexibility of multi-cloud is something that um, that is a hallmark of what modern data protection should look like. And oh, by the way, the ability to move from on-prem to a cloud again. So lots of different ways that kind of comes together. And it's that it's that breadth and diversity of platforms to be protected that's kind of going to lean us into our last section. In this case, let's start by resetting the expectations on uh, on Veeam as, as that virtualization provider of choice. Uh, 
Leah, I'm looking on here, and yeah, there's that VMware logo in that upper right-hand corner. There sure is a whole bunch of cloudy stuff beyond that. Absolutely, and that's where standardization seems to be the sort of magic hat trick that we have um, that so many organizations are looking for. And, and we don't say that to be a product pitch. We say that because when we are out in the field, when we are talking to organizations looking to make a switch, when we are talking to some of our, our longest standing lean users and asking how can we help, what should we be focused on, it's really about making sure that everything in the sphere of control is now put under the same umbrella so that you can have a policy-based approach to protection, so that you can uh, increase your threat surface, right? Making sure that everything is protected from ransomware so that you can do things better. You know, we talk a lot about day two operations, being able to report and orchestrate. The Veeam platform, that, that really becomes a lot of our promise and certainly the promise of innovation too. Um, we certainly next year have a tremendous um, set of launches coming up. Uh, we have Veeam Backup for Microsoft Office 365 having a new version. We most recently launched Veeam Backup for Salesforce. Um, those of us on the cloud team were preparing for launches of Veeam Backup for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. We also have some tremendous enhancements to Veeam Backup and Replication, wow. including things like Veeam Cloud Connect enhancements for disaster recovery as a service. Um, we're making significant enhancements and changes and opportunities for our object storage support within the cloud. So um, AWS S3, Azure Blob, the innovation is endless. And a lot of that is driven not only from user feedback, but also I think the survey results tell the story of that feedback so well. And there's a lot to be excited about, Jason, when we look at Veeam in 2023. Love that, love that. All right, let's set up a few last things that that as organizations are getting ready for 2023, we're gonna grab a few other data points that um, hopefully set the groundwork for what else should you be thinking about or planning for as we get through that. Certainly one of them we talk about cloud protection is the idea of long-term retention. So, and I think this is an area, by the way, that when folks go back to their teams and talk, they should be really sensitive to because for a lot of organizations, people think that um, because the cloud is natively durable, that the requirements for backup um, are not as great from a failover perspective. And that part is true. What isn't true is if you have a five-year retention mandate for your data, you have a five-year retention mandate for your data, regardless of whether you've chosen to put that data on servers or within service sets. And so this is actually one of the questions which is a little bit more troublesome. So when organizations were asked, how long are they retaining their data from cloud hosts? Only about half of them were even holding their data for one year, much less uh, more than one year along that way. You can build the slide out and said, okay, so when organizations are um, retaining for more than one year, where are they putting it? And to your point, Leah, uh, you know, some folks want to put it in a different cloud right? So um, Azure to, to Amazon or vice versa. Other folks, as I said before, I'm a fan of one cloud or another. So the Veeam Cloud Service Provider community is great for that. Um, if you're not going to do that and you want to use the same cloud, I'm going to tell you best practice is make sure you use separate credentials for your repositories than you do for your production environment so the bad actor can't get in there. And I love the fact that this can tape. Um, still kind of pull into this fray. So certainly long-term retention is going to be one area that you should be thinking about along the way. But similar to that, when you think about what's going to be most important as you plan for 2023 and cloud, you should be thinking about how do you make sure that immutability is a huge part of your design goals. And to walk you through that, I'm going to bring out a data point from the ransomware research, where in this case we were at, uh, the question was, of a thousand organizations surveyed in the ransomware report, not being customers, but again, by the way, unbiased panel, they were asked, um, were the backup repositories targeted as part of the cyber um, um, attack? And the answer, two thirds of the of environments was that, yeah, the, the repository was affected because if you ain't got your backups anymore, you have no other choice other than to pay the ransom, right? I'm gonna repeat that. If you don't have your backups anymore, your only other choice is to pay the ransom. And so, yeah, for a vast majority of organizations, um, um, uh, trying to remove the repository was step one 
once that bad actor uh, got in the environment. So as you think about how do you plan for that, um, here's some other data from this, and from the, and I think this lines up pretty nicely with the cloud protection trends readout that we're doing today, because when you look at it, you'll see that um, you know there's lots of different ways that organizations can be offline or air gapped or immutable, but for three out of four organizations, the expectation is the cloud is going to be one of their immutable, air gappable, offlineable, survivable tiers. The other ones that are out there, um, uh, you know, certainly on-prem disk and Leah, if we had more time, V12 and direct to object starts to look really, really cool for that. And I love the fact that even in 2023, folks are thinking about tape as part of their survival repository plan. Tape will never die. Certainly not at Veeam. Veeam will continue to support tape um, because I simply think for extremely long-term retention, it just makes way too much sense. Object storage can still be an unruly beast, right? And that bill shock can still happen in object storage. So I love to see the breadth of plans and Veeam will continue to support that breadth of plans because cloud is not one size fits all. No, and in fact, when you add up those three stats, you're gonna see it's, it's uh, nearly 200% along the way. There is no oh. reason why you cannot architect a solution which is not immutable at each and every tier, which then makes it part of, let's call it a layered approach where cyber resiliency and then all of the other disasters that organizations face can all be thought of in the same way. I wanna kind of double down on that for a second because I know we're almost out of time, but we haven't really gotten a chance to plug my favorite component of the uh, of the Veeam solution story and strategy, and that is around orchestration. So it's important to recognize that while ransomware is a disaster, it's not the only disaster that organizations still have to face. Fire still happens, flood still happens, theft still happens. Um, along that way. So for all of these kinds of disasters that are going on, when we think about how do you meet, remediate from that, one of the key design criteria that folks want to be, ought to be excited about is, um, is orchestration, right? So um, I do a lot of work with scouts, and when I do work with scouts, we teach the first aid merit badge, and what I teach to them, your likelihood of survival is to shrink the time between snake bite and hospital. Right? What can you do to shrink the time between snake bite and hospital? How do you do that in IT? Orchestrated workflows. You get all that expertise um, scripted, you get the humans out of the way, and frankly, I'm a little disappointed only one in four organizations are leveraging orchestrated workflows for this, but I'm thinking with what we're gonna see in orchestrator version six as part of the release uh, in early 23, um, I think that's gonna balloon because um, there's a lot of cool stuff coming for that, Leah. Absolutely. And, and ultimately, uh, for those of you in the, in the audience, this is why we curated the research that we did. Obviously, our focus was on the Cloud Protection Trends Report, and I cannot encourage you enough to go download that report. But we also have tremendous research on the data protection field at large, on uh, resiliency and ransomware. There's so much to learn about that field. So I encourage you to download all the reports that we featured in here today as you prepare for 2023. And especially for those of you who are current Veeam users, make your plan for upgrade because there is so much coming in V12. And, and there's a lot of ways that you can prepare for that. Certainly downloading a lot of this research is one of them. Sounds good. All right. Um, so hopefully what you heard today, uh, Veeam is, is not just uh, about uh, uh, about. Uh, virtualization or not just the data center. There's a lot of other breadth that comes comes into that. Um, I hope you also heard about the expertise that happens when cloud service providers become uh, part of the equation as well. Um, I guess we're going to wrap it up with just, you know, giving a plug for there is so much exciting technology which is coming. We do the research to understand where the market's going and then we release products to hopefully align with or supersede um, what customers need before they're actually going to need it. Uh, we're coming up on a pretty big release, uh, aren't we, Leah? Yeah, absolutely. And again, there's a lot of ways to prepare for that release, but one of our number one ways that we recommend you getting ready for an upcoming release is by joining the Veeam community. Um, you know, folks from product strategy, product marketing, our systems engineering organization, we all try to collaborate in the Veeam community resource hub. Um, we have one of the best communities, I would say, across the industry, and that's because we've built an organization of zealots, of, of folks who love backup, 
love the fact that Veeam is a leader in the backup space, but we have a lot of work to do. We need to bring more people to the table across SaaS, IaaS, PaaS. Um, we need to continue to transform workloads and help our companies Companies make sure that they're they're still thinking about still about data protection when they move those workloads to the cloud. So we need to band together and help each other out because there's just too much going on for anybody to feel like an expert. I know <laughs> I certainly don't. So joining a community like this is an amazing opportunity. <laughs> I never feel like an expert. That's that's the, and I shouldn't, right? We always have something to learn. Um, so join the user groups, join that online community. We're going to be posting a lot of V12 content. Um, blogs about upgrade plans, um, plans for, for what's coming in the next release. We certainly teased a lot in this presentation today and the discussion boards. You get to hear from folks who have already tested the betas and they can tell you exactly what their experience was, some, some gotchas and some things to look for. But ultimately it's a great opportunity to hear the tremendous excitement of what's coming in 2023. So thank you so much for joining us what? on this webinar. All that thought, oh, sorry, Jessica. All that thought. Yeah. Because you mentioned that no one can be an expert, but would you want to make sure that um, that uh, if you do want to sound more like an expert, we've got quite a bit of data that you can download. So all the reports that we talked about today, you can download them here. So grab this screenshot for five seconds um, while uh, while Leah closes this out. So the, we've covered the data protection report, we covered the ransomware report, cloud protection trends in that lower right hand corner. You mentioned Salesforce, that's in here as well. Download those reports as well, um, and uh, and thanks for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And we really look forward to working with you guys in 2023 and beyond.